indication that their hearts and spirits were bankrupt and that it, would, it was void of the presence of God. And so they remain silent. Sometimes the worst response that we can have to the human dilemma is to be indifferent. Either be passionate about what it is you're going to do. Just be passionate about it. Look at people hurting. Look at people that are poor. Look at people who are trapped in situations and circumstances of dysfunction, of sin, or whatever it might be. Look at them and say, it's their fault. I'm not going to help them. They're just tired. They're trifling. They don't deserve my help. But don't be indifferent. <laughs> don't, don't just be indifferent. Don't act like you don't see them when you do see them. Jesus said, I would rather that you were hot or cold than be lukewarm and indifferent. And so indifference is the sign of a cold, calloused heart that has become shellacked over with pride and narcissistic self-centeredness. And so Jesus now is going to set these guys up, or they've really set themselves up. They remain silent. They remain silent. That's an indictment against the church. It's an indictment against the church when we are silent toward the plight of the poor, the oppressed, the disenfranchised, the homeless, the incarcerated, the ill, the infirm. It's an indictment against us when we are silent. As the people of God, we are to have the heart of God and the compassion of God, and we are to be moved with compassion when we see human pain and suffering. We can't address it all, we can't deal with it all, but we can lift the issue up and we can plead the case and the cause for the poor and the oppressed. But they were silent. And then Jesus in verse five, he, he says to them, which of you having a donkey, a jackass, or an ox that has fallen into a pit and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. He asks the question that touches them where they really is, live. They value their livestock. They value their donkeys and their ox and their cattle and all their beasts of burden because in an agrarian society, you needed these beasts of burdens to plow the field, to turn over the soil and to harvest in the crops. So a person's donkey, a person's mule, a person's ox was of great value to them, and they treated them better than they did most people. So it is in our society today. There are some doctors, I mean, there are some animals that get better health care than a lot of folk. We got animal hospitals, and we should be humane toward animals, don't get me wrong. I got a little dog, and I love her to death. But she's always glad to see me when nobody else is. So I love her to death. I pick her up, I hug her, I talk to her. She's always glad to see me. I get up early in the morning, let her out, and I give her a treat. She just spins around in the floor. She's just happy. It don't take much to make her happy. And so I'm compassionate toward animals. Don't think that I'm some sadistic, indifferent person toward animals. But we, and very often, can be more compassionate toward an animal than we are a human being. And that's what Jesus is showing here with these religious leaders. So here he exposes the, the first characteristic of a kingdom citizen. Kingdom citizens are compassionate. Kingdom citizens are compassionate toward the bruised, the battered, the manhandled, the mauled, the disfigured, and the dysfunctional. Kingdom citizens are compassionate because kingdom citizens understand, except by the grace of God. There goes me, I've not lived so well I've not been so spiritual, I've not been so faithful to God that it resulted in me not being homeless, not being crippled, not being maimed. It's only by the grace of God. So a kingdom citizens live with this tremendous tension of knowing that it's only by the grace of God, it's only the good hand of God that has shielded me and protected me from the various vicissitudes, complications, and destructions that could have befallen me. Kingdom citizens are compassionate toward the hurting, the aching. And so Jesus tries to pull on their heartstrings that if you can show compassion for your donkey and for your ox, cannot you show compassion for this man here that's before you? 
And if on the Sabbath day you will justify being able to pull your ox or your donkey out of the ditch because it would be inhumane to leave them there in that ditch, is it not so inhumane to leave a person that is hurting in their dilemma? See, the greatest truth is the truth that you discover for yourself. And so rather than tell people the obvious answer, Jesus would lead them and then allow them to discover the truth for themselves and then decide whether or not they would embrace the truth or reject it. So the principle is kingdom citizens are compassionate toward the hurting. And what he's saying to them subliminally, if you're not compassionate toward the hurting, it might mean that you're not truly a kingdom citizen. That's the hidden message. And then he moves on. Verse 7. So he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noted they chose the best places, saying to them, We, when you are invited by anyone by, by, to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man. Then you began with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be abased and who humbles himself will be exalted. The second principle, kingdom citizens are humble. They don't exalt themselves, they allow others to exalt them and to lift them up. Let the words of others speak well of you. And so he says, in a simple parable, you guys are used to parading in a place, and y'all just assume that the chief seat is reserved for you. So whenever you see a sign that says, reserved for the big shot, you just go up in there and just plop yourself down as if you automatically are supposed to be in the big seat. He says, no, no, that's not what a kingdom citizen does. A kingdom citizen is just happy just to get the invitation to be in the house. So a kingdom citizen does not assume that they're the one being honored. A kingdom citizen is not assuming. They take a seat in the back, and they wait till someone come and lift them up and elevate them and bring them up to a higher seat so they can see that they are being honored by the host who's invited them. Are you following? Now, don't misinterpret this there. So, see, the, in the church, we misinterpret this. So we think this means we should come and sit in the back of the church. That's not what that means. That's, that's, not, that's not what that means. No, no, no. No, it doesn't mean that the back is reserved for you. All right, leave the back open for somebody who comes and just come on the slide. In. You can bring yourself on down to the front. I'm inviting you to the front. But the kingdom citizen is, is humble. The kingdom citizen does not blow his or her own trumpet or horn. The kingdom citizen allows others to speak highly of them and allows others' words to lift them up or exalt them in due time. A saint kingdom citizen understands that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. For in due time, if he pleases him, he will lift us up. He will exalt us. He doesn't spend a lot of time here. He just lays down the principle and let them wrestle with it and deal with it. Kingdom citizens are compassionate, they were not. Kingdom citizens are humble, they were not. The third principle in verse 12. Then he also said to him who invited him, now he speaks directly to the guy who invited him to the dinner, because any time the Pharisees invited Jesus to a dinner on the Sabbath day, it was a setup. They were trying to set him up, you see, to some kind of way they could discredit him, that he would say or teach something that would come in to conflict and contradiction with what they taught, then they could accuse him of not being a true Jew and accuse him of violating the Sabbath. Are you following? So now he speaks directly to him. He said, now you, when you give a dinner, don't ask your friends to come, your brothers and your relatives and your rich neighbors. <laughs> Talking directly to the guy. All you do is invite your friends, your brothers, your neighbors, your rich friends, because all you believe in, you believe in reciprocity. In the legal world, they call it quid pro quo, quo, this for that. You don't invite nobody unless you know they're going to invite you back. You never extend an invitation unless you know that person has the, mean, the means 
to reciprocate and return the favor. You don't do nothing out of the goodness of your own heart. Instead of inviting all of your big shot friends and all of your neighbors from the same socioeconomic level that you're in, why don't you invite